So I want to thank Judah, who initiated this whole relationship um, and asked me to speak, and Alan for facilitating this. It's really been wonderful, and I'm excited to be here with you. Uh, just for clarity, uh, the Strauss family that I'm talking about is the family that owned Macy's for almost 100 years. And it's also the family of Isidore and Ida Strauss who went down together on Titanic. And I'm always asked this, it is not the family of Levi Strauss. That's an entirely different family. That's the family credit, the man credited with inventing genes. Uh, and I am also not a family member, although I know more about them than they do. Judah and Alan asked me to give you an overview of the history of Nathan Strauss and his interest in Zionism. I've been the family's historian for more than 30 years, and I could keep you here for days, probably weeks, telling you stories about them, but I'm going to try and pick out the most interesting parts so you won't fall asleep during my talk. So I'm going to start with a brief overview of the history of the family, and then I'll focus on Nathan and his very many, many accomplishments. So the Strauss family it's a German Jewish family who originated in the southwestern part of Germany uh, in the Rheinfels area. And this is a part of, of the country that was sometimes France and sometimes Germany, depending on the political situation. And they were prosperous people, they were educated, and they spoke both French, German, and Hebrew, no English. They owned land that was cultivated for crops. And Lazarus, who you can see on the left, um, was the, became the head of the family when his father died in 1838. He was 29 years old and the oldest of 14. So what drove him, it sounds like a pretty good life, what drove him to America? Well, he raised money to support the failed revolution of 1848, but he didn't participate in it. And the revolution resulted from an effort by Napoleon to regulate and to tax the Jewish people. Lazarus earned that he was going to be called before the courts to explain his actions. And after the revolution, there were hard economic times and he learned that he wanted to avoid a bankruptcy. He was in charge of all the money for his siblings and he was trying to protect that. And he also didn't want to be called before the courts. And so he decided to emigrate. So this is the house that they lived in in Otterberg. And this house is still standing today. Uh, it's being used as an insurance company. Um, in 1808, Napoleon decreed that Jews had to take fixed surnames, permanent surnames, and the Strausses chose that name, Strauss. Um, they have a story that the reason they chose that name is because outside the door of their house, there was a Bari relief plaque with an image of an ostrich. And in German, Strauss with one final S is ostrich. Now, a Strauss with two final S's is a bunch of flowers. So one doesn't know why they would choose one over the other. And I have never seen an ostrich wandering around Southern Germany, but it's their story and they stick to it. So this is Lazarus's passport. He traveled because of the impending uh, discussions with the court, he wanted to quietly slip out of Germany. And so he went to this town, Saragamine, in France, where he obtained his passport. And then he traveled to La Havre, where he caught a ship going to Philadelphia, which was the center of German Jewish immigration at the time. But he was advised that there would be greater opportunities for him in the South, since German Jews had been immigrating to Philadelphia for many years and they were well established there. So here we have a picture of Georgia and America's South. Um, he went to Western Georgia, not far from Columbus, to start his new life in America. He was 43 years old. He spoke no English and he was an observant Jew. Now he may have known this Kathman family in Germany as they lived in Winweiler, which was near Otterberg and Jews in the area seemed to have all known each other. The Kathman brothers set him up with a dry goods business in Oglethorpe. In, they had moved there in 1851, the year before. And they supplied him with a push cart. On the right, you can see this is a mock-up, a reproduction of a peddler's cart. Now, those of us who come from New York and especially know about the Lower East Side, about peddlers, we have a very negative view of peddlers as poor immigrants. But in the South, they didn't have many cities or to even towns, and they didn't have fewer stores. And so the peddler really served a good function. They had plantations, which were widely separated, and so Lazarus would have this cart with a horse and he would go from 
plantation to plantation and bring goods that these people had ordered. He would go back to New York and Philadelphia, buy them, bring them back. But he also brought news from one plantation to the other. And so he was very well thought of and did well. And then um, on one of his routes, he wound up in, in a little tiny town called Talbotton, which happens to be the county seat of Talbot County. And he happened to arrive there on court day when once a month court was held and the farmers and the merchants all brought their goods to the town because so many people came to town on court day. And he later said it was the first civilized place that he visited since arriving in the South. So by 1854, that was two years after he'd arrived, he felt sufficiently settled and wanted to bring his family. He leased half of a, of a store from Captain Curley at Taylor and opened a dry goods store in Talbotton. So in 1854, he sent for his family, his wife, Sarah, and their very four very young children, Isidore, Hermione, Nathan, and Oscar arrived in New York Harbor on September 1854 on the maiden ship of the mail ship SS St. Louis. Now, Lazarus has traveled north and met them on the dock. So when the ship arrived, the kids could see them him even before they got off the ship. They didn't go south immediately because there was yellow fever ep epidemic. So they went to Philadelphia and stayed there for th three weeks. Then they took a ship. You can see this advertisement for the ship uh, to Savannah and then a train to a little tiny town called Geneva, not far from Talbot, and then a, a, a cart that carried their belongings called a rockaway and very large wheels, horse-drawn cart to their house. And can you imagine uh, a mother traveling all this distance? She went from Otterberg, she went to Paris, she went to La Havre, to Philadelphia, to Savannah, to Geneva, with four very, very young children. And here we have a picture of the Strausses. This was taken about 1860. And if you look at the way she's sitting, holding that arm, she had had a stroke about two years before she left Germany. And so I think for me, it's even more remarkable that she was able to make this trip with four very, very young children. The youngest, Oscar, was born in 1850. And so the youngest was four, Isidore was nine. And she did travel with one young woman to help her out. But still, I think it's really quite remarkable that she was able to make this trip. Um, one can only imagine in retrospect, how much having handicapped mother might've affected Nathan and his siblings. And perhaps this was empathy was learned during his formative years because of his mother's handicap. So here we have the young children. These pictures were all taken before 1860 in Talbot. Isidore was born in 1845. Hermione, who's the only daughter, was born in 1846, Nathan in 1848, and Oscar in 1850. Now I have so many stories about the Strausses and especially about their time in Talbot that I could keep you here for hours, but I'm gonna interest some time, I would say only a few. So Nathan collected hemp fiber which he wove into rope and sold. And with the proceeds, he bought himself a pony, which the family kept until it was taken from them by a union general during the war. In those days, women wore talc on their faces to whiten their skin, sort of like face powder. And Nathan bought a ball of, of talc for about 10 cents, divided it into 10 balls and sold each of those for 10 cents, thereby making a huge profit. Now, since there were few stores or other sources of merchandise in the South, the women were willing to pay these exorbitant prices. And he was always a wheeler dealer and always had an idea about how he could make more money. This is a picture of the first home the Strausses had in Talbot. And to me, it looks like a shack. And coming from a prosperous family in Germany, it was hard for me to imagine that they would be thrilled by this, but the family seemed to like it. Oscar, who later went on to a very illustrious career in public service, wrote his autobiography. And he described it this way. We found a very comfortable home ready for us. My precocious brother Isidore immediately inspected the hole and thought it odd to be in a house built on stilts, as he called it. There were no basements in these houses and the houses were built up or off the land a little bit in case there was flooding. So all three boys attended Collinsworth Institute, a one year, a one room schoolhouse. And here we have a report card from Nathan from January to July, 1860. And we can see he studied orthography, which was spelling and grammar, 
reading, writing, geography, arithmetic, and declamation, which was public speaking. He was graded excellent only in arithmetic, and he was absent from prayer seven times. The Strausses moved to the house pictured here in 1861, and they lived in that house until 1863 when we moved to the town, actually the city of Columbus. During the war between the states, that's what they call it in the South, we in the North call it the Civil War, merchants weren't able to travel North to obtain supplies. And this resulted in extreme shortages of necessary items that were not produced in the mostly agrarian South. In September of 1862, the grand jury of Talbot County issued a presentment accusing the Jews who were the merchants of speculation and extortion. And Lazarus, who up until that time believed he was a valued member of the community, was so hurt by this presentment that he moved his family 38 miles west to Columbus. The trip 38 miles took an entire day, but he was able to pack up everything he owned in one cart. Think about moving today, what a monumental task that would be. Things were different then. The city of Columbus was occupied April 16th, 1865, Easter Sunday, actually after the war was over. And unfortunately, General Wilson hadn't received word and burned the city. And Lazarus was left with almost nothing. And he felt the South was going to take a very long time to recover. And he wasn't a young man. So he decided to start over at age 57 in the North. The family traveled first to Philadelphia, a trip of eight days, and then to New York on older son Isidore's suggestion. And letters from Lazarus to his family still back in Germany describe the robberies, the fires, the killings. And he wrote in September of 1865 that he'd been out of business since April and that he would feel calmer and more satisfied when he had going business again. And Isidore hoped they'd go into the import business together. On their trip north, the family went by coach to Nashville where they caught a train to Philadelphia. And the family tells the story that Nathan, who was wearing gray clothing, was snatched off the train by former soldiers, just as the family was boarding. And the train left the station without 17-year-old Nathan. He had 25 cents in his pocket and had to wait until the following day for the next train to take him to his parents. A kindly vendor gave him ice cream, the first he'd ever had. But he spent the next the, all that time hungry and frightened. And he vowed then that if he ever could, if he ever had the means, he'd do whatever he could to alleviate hunger and suffering in people. <clears throat> and the family believes that that was the nexus of his interest in philanthropy. Once the family was reunited, they moved to New York where Lazarus used the time until they could figure out what to do next by visiting his suppliers and paying off the debts from before the war. The only money he had was from selling off cotton that he had stored, but he sold it at a considerable loss. But he stated that even if he left his children nothing else, he wanted to leave them a good name. And Mr. Caldwell was so impressed with Lazarus' integrity, this was the first penny he'd received from any of his Southern accounts, that he offered to sell Lazarus his business. He said Lazarus wouldn't get rich, but that he could make a living. So Lazarus brought the business for $6,000. It's quite a lot of money in those days. But in the first year, he earned 60000 a feat that the Strausses chalked up to hard work and frugality. The lease was signed in May of 1866, and L. Strauss and Sons was formed. Lazarus and Isidore were partners. Once Nathan wasn't interested in formal learning, but he did complete his high school education in New York and never went on to college. And then he joined the family firm after completing high school. In his travels, he'd become friendly with a man named Roland Hussey Macy, who was the owner of a dry goods store. At that time, it was on 14th Street and 6th Avenue. And the Strausses opened a concession in the basement of this store in 1874, selling their product. It soon became the most popular venue in the store and in the first year alone accounted for 60% of the store's sales. And for the first time, two different types of merchandise Dry goods and home furnishings were sold under one roof. And it was on this distinction that Macy claimed to be the original department store. Roland Hussey Macy died in 1877 while on a trip to Paris, and Nathan was with him. Macy's heirs were unable to take over the running of the store after succession of partners. In 1888, the Strausses became partners in Macy's, and by 1894, they owned the entire business. 
They continued to expand L. Strauss and & Sons, and in 1893 also became partners in Abraham & Wexler, which they renamed Abraham & Strauss, a Brooklyn department store. And Isidore stayed in the store attending to business, while Nathan, who had too much energy to sit still in an office, traveled around the country opening up new markets and to Europe on buying trips. And as their sons completed college, they also started working in the family business. And this is just a quick picture of the Strauss's uh, store, Al Strauss and Sons. Other, much of their merchandise, other than the glass, which they cut themselves, was imported from Europe. And much of that was produced in their own china factories and porcelain factories in France, Carlsbad, Rudolstadt, and Bohemia. Most of the factories were managed by relatives, family members who had remained in Germany. And they also bought lamps, majolic, and other items from European suppliers. The Strausses remained close to their family who had not immigrated to the U.S. and Nathan often visited his relatives in Germany when he went to Europe on buying trips. In 1875, he had a letter of introduction and visited the Guterres family. He was introduced to Lena, who he married one month later. And here they are on their wedding day in, in Ludwigshafen, which is where Lena's family was from. Her father, Simpson was a prominent physician who died suddenly in 1866, leaving her mother, Johanna, with eight children. And as the Strauss family porcelain and china business grew, they set up their factories all over Europe and Lena's brothers, Oscar and Edgar, apprenticed there. They eventually managed these factories and then opened their own. So you could imagine how advantageous it was for the Strausses to be supplying their US businesses with their own merchandise. And this is a picture of Nathan and his family. On the left is their son, Charles Webster Strauss, who later changed his name to Nathan Strauss Jr. Then comes Lena, Nathan, and Hugh Grant Strauss, who was named for the mayor of New York City, and their daughter, Sissy. And this is taken in their New York City apartment, 27 West 72nd Street. Each room had a different decor and a different name. So this one is the Pompeian room. Lena was a strong supporter of all of Nathan's projects and philanthropies, and during their entire marriage, she was at his side, giving him support and encouragement, as well as protecting him from hurtful publicity. And although it's not realized in those days, today Nathan would have been des des uh, diagnosed as bipolar. It's why he could accomplish so much when he was in one of his manic phrases. But when he crashed, Lena was able to protect him and to see that he had the support, a calm environment, and treatment he required until he was well again. Nathan bought a horse and a carriage shortly after his marriage in 1875, and he couldn't afford both the horse and his wife, so he sold half of his share in the horse. And when his bride came to America, she saved from her household allowance and bought back that half share of a horse. And here we have Nathan driving his horse. This horse is called Cobwebs on what was then called the Speedway, which is now today a major road in Manhattan called Harlem River Drive. Before 1902, it became clear that Macy's 14th Street store was no longer big enough and there was no more room to expand either on 14th Street or on 6th Avenue. And Isidore and Nathan quietly began buying a property on 34th Street and Herald Square. And at the time it was far north of the center of commerce, but they had a vision. They knew there was going to be an uptown expansion of the existing subway line and that a crosstown bus route was proposed and they felt it was a good time to move. So on November 8th, 1902, the Herald Square store opened for business. Now, a quick side story is you can notice where it says Cubanola, there is a notch in that building. And the reason for that is because when they quietly were buying up uh, all the properties, the owner of that piece of property held out thinking he'd get a lot more money if he just held out and the Strausses just didn't buy it. They said, we just won't be held up like that. And so they never, and they still don't own that corner piece of property. As you know, Macy's prospered. One can hardly travel anywhere in the United States today without finding a branch of the store. There are 800 branches of Macy's in this country and they continue to own it to a very bitter leverage buyout in 1986. I wish it was time to tell you about more of the Strauss brothers, each of whom had amazing careers and each was totally different. Although each was good in many spheres, each became known for a particular aspect. Oscar was a public servant, Nathan was best known as a philanthropist, and Isidore best known as a merchant. 
So as I've told you, Nathan had far too much energy to be contained in a classroom or an office. He was a man with a multitude of ideas and many of them involved how he could help his fellow man. He anonymously gave out free turkeys at Thanksgiving to all Macy's employees and instituted health care within the workplace, which was the first. They set up a lunchroom where employees could get free coffee and lunch at a minimal price once he learned that they were foregoing food in order to save money for the ailing family mem members. Theirs was the first mutual aid society within business. When there was a coal strike, he supplied coal to the freezing people of New York at a minimal price because he believed that charity could be demeaning. And he insisted that those who needed to benefit from his largesse should in no way have to sacrifice self-respect or independence. He gave anonymously, personally directing these projects and while, without accepting contributions or assistance from other people. Only once during this coal strike, he accepted some money from J. Pierpont Morgan, and he was sorry about it later, regretted it, and never did anything like that again. In the 1890s, two of his very young children died, and Nathan worried, wondered if the cow that was infected with tuberculosis could have carried that disease into the milk. He learned, he knew Louis Pasteur and learned that he had invented a process for heating milk till almost boiling in order to kill germs. But Pasteur hadn't made the, the leap to milk. It was Nathan who did that. He built a pasteurization laboratory, and we have a picture of it here, and opened milk depots where free or low cost milk could, could be distributed to the city's poor. He would give coupons to pediatricians to give out to children, to the mothers of young children, so they could get this milk for free, but they felt it was a prescription and they weren't, they weren't feeling like they were being received charity. And then he spread the program around the country and then all over the world. And he offered that if any municipality would send medical professionals to learn the process, he would pay to build the laboratory and set up milk depots at no cost to them. The results of this initiative were startling. The death rate of infants in New York went from 125 per thousand in 1891 to 15 per thousand in 1925. And this achievement alone earned him widespread recognition during his lifetime. In 1917, Lena wrote a book, Disease in Milk, The Remedy, Pasteurization, to promote their work. And she was his devoted supporter in every philanthropy the two championed. Nathan's interest in public health wasn't confined to pasteurization. In the late 1800s and 19, early 1900s, tuberculosis was rampant, especially in the poorest neighborhoods. Nathan, who had been denied admittance to the Lake Hood Hotel in New Jersey because he was Jewish, went out with a group of friends and bought the hotel. In 1909, he turned it into what he called a preventorium reasoning that if you took healthy children, and that was the key, these were healthy children, but you took them out of homes where TV was prevalent and gave them fresh air, exercise, and nutritious food, that they would build up their immune systems and not also succumb to TB. You know, that was pretty forward thinking. People didn't even really know about immune systems in 1909. But certainly this worked and he, he received a lot of recognition and became a very popular process in those days. And during his travels, Nathan and Lena visited Palestine in 1904. They were so taken with the conditions there that they began to focus much of their philanthropy on their spiritual whole land. He wrote after that trip that they felt an intense desire to return to the Holy Land, and they gave up any idea of going elsewhere. So maybe here's a good time to digress. The Strausses were observant Jews and continued to practice their religion even after immigrating to the United States. But each member of the family seemed to have practiced it in a different manner. Nathan's father, Lazarus, commented while he was living in, in Talbot in Georgia that the family ate pork because there was very little other protein to be had. And he thought God would have wanted them to be healthy and to survive. Lazarus was a religious scholar. The ministers and pastors from the Methodist, Baptist, and Episcopal churches regularly visited him to have physical phil, this, excuse me, philosophical discussions, often about their religions. And the children went to Sunday school and were taught religion by the Methodist minister, but in deference to the Judaism, only from the Old Testament. After they moved to New York City in 1866, Lazarus became a leader at Temple Bethel 
and established Reform Congregation. And once Nathan married and established an independent household, he and his family were also members of Bethel. And then Temple Emmanuel, once the two congregations merged in the late 1920s. But he didn't believe that attendance at services were required. He was often on the road or living at a summer residence for protracted periods of time. His children were given religious instruction at home when it was possible, but their observance seems to have been sporadic at best. That said, Nathan and Lena always seem to have a strong connection to the Judaism, and their descendants also still event identify as Jews, and most belong to Reformed congregations. Well, ma many other members of the Strauss family have less strong ties today, and some don't even identify as Jewish. One member of the family told me many years ago, I'm Episcopalian, but of course everybody knows we're Jewish. And for him, there was no conflict in this statement. Okay, <coughs> back to Palestine. In 1912, Nathan and Lena returned to Palestine and they established workrooms to help young people acquire skills. And they created a domestic science school for girls. And they set up a fund to support Bezalel School for Arts. And they funded soup kitchens, which they continued to fund until Nathan's death in 1931, and which his descendants continued to support for many years after that. Lena sold all her jewelry. In those days, it was about $18,000 worth, which you can imagine today. It was a huge sum and gave the proceeds to Henrietta Zold, the Jewish Zionist leader and founder of Hadassah. They also acquired various tracts of land. In Nathan's words, on learning that a piece of land opposite the tomb of Rachel was for sale, we acquired it in order to prevent the holy ground from getting into undesirable hands. Nathan and Lena built the Jerusalem Health Center, whose function was to spearhead sanitary conditions and hygienic reform and to fight diseases such as malaria and trachoma, which were claiming so many visit, uh, victims. And once again, like with his fight to get pasteurization accepted around the world, Nathan and Lena thought that his vision, through his vision and dogged determination, succeeded in creating a public health revolution that saved countless lives. And as you know, the city of Netanya was named to honor Nathan Strauss. Following this trail, this particular piece of history is an intriguing journey that tells us the story of a unique individual who did more than anybody else to ensure the fulfillment of the Zionist dream. So before I go any further, I wanna credit Judah Harstein, who I will be liberally quoting in this next section. Judah contacted me many years ago when he was doing research for an article about Netanya and about Nathan Strauss. And although I could supply him with historical information about the lives and accomplishments about Nathan and Lena, I had little to contribute about this piece of history. And so I've learned a lot from Judah, who I thank and credit here. When I first started working with the Strauss family more than 30 years ago, Nathan and Lena's daughter-in-law, Flora Stieglitz Strauss, told me that the lovely city of Netanya was named for Nathan Strauss and that this was done in the hope that they would benefit from his charity by doing so. Nathan told them that he'd already given away three quarters of his fortune and had no more to give. The mayor of Netanya, Ben Ami, was sent to New York with instructions to speak personally with the Strausses and to convince him to give. The mayor, it seems, was excited to be staying in their lovely and opulent country home, Driftwood, in Maranac, New York City, just north of the city. He expected to be wined and dined. And he was therefore quite disappointed when he came down for breakfast the first morning, only to be served a bowl of cold cereal, bananas, and poached eggs. And he had to return home empty-handed. And that was the story I was told by Lena. Judah wrote, the documentary evidence that exists gives the story a somewhat different color. Ovid Ben Ami, later indeed to become the first mayor of Netanya, was one of the leaders of B'nai Binyamin, Ben Yumen, an organization dedicated to the development of Jewish agricultural settlements in the Holy Land. He and his colleague Itamar ben Avi, the son of Eliezer ben Yehuda, the founder of modern Jewish language, had met Nathan Strauss during a 1923 visit and had introduced him to their organization and their work. Nathan took a fond interest in Ben uh, B'nai ben Yamin and its leaders and willingly gave them his moral and material support. 
today one can see, excuse me, I need a cough drop. One can see in the Netanyahu Museum, a letter from Nathan Strauss dated September, 1926, which demonstrates the affection that he had for this group. In the letter, he warmly congratulates Ovid Ben Ami and his bride on their marriage, asking him to accept my wife and my heartiest greetings, and also to Mr. and Mrs. Ben Avi and to our mutual friends in the Holy Land. <coughs> in 1928, the year of Nathan Strauss's 80th birthday, Itamar and Oved were on a visit to the United States, seeking funds for the development of a new seashore community north of Herzliya. Itamar ben Ami decided it would be a wonderful idea to name the new settlement Netanaya in honor of Nathan Strauss and in honor of Nathan Ka, that God had given the land to his people. Nathan Strauss welcomed the gesture and gave the project his blessing and a gift of $1,000 and a promise of $1,000 per year for the next four years. Judah wrote, it may well have been the case that Itamar and Ovid had hoped for a much larger donation, but it really appears that the naming of the settlement was a genuine demonstration of gratitude and appreciation for a man who had done so much to help the Jewish residents of the land of Palestine. And for Nathan Strauss, it proved to be a permanent memorial that endures that the name of this remarkable man is forever on his lips. Nathan wrote, Give until it feels good. He said, what you give in health is gold. What you give in sickness is silver. And what you give in death <coughs> is lead. Excuse me. By the time he died in 1931, he had given away three quarters of his fortune. <coughs> and he is revered around the world for his selfless philanthropy. Theirs was a 55-year marriage of love, devotion, and mutual support. Lena died in May of 1930, and Nathan, bereft at her loss, joined her <coughs> in January, six months later. <coughs> they are interred in the Strauss Cones Mausoleum at Machpelah Cemetery in Brooklyn, in New York. On the anniversary of Israel's independence, the Israeli embassy in the United States awarded medals to 70 individuals who did the most for the 70 year old country. And Nathan and Lena Strauss were among those honored. And I was privileged to accept this award on behalf of the family from the Israeli amb ambassador in the US, Ron Dermer, at an award ceremony in Washington DC along with two Strauss, Nathan Strauss descendants. So as I come to the end of my talk, I hope you've learned something about this amazing man and his family. Succeeding generations have carried on this tradition of public service and philanthropy, and there isn't nearly enough time to tell you about them. But if you want to learn more, I write a newsletter twice a year that's posted on our website. And please visit there and take a look at some of the issues of the newsletter that can be found on the archives page. You'll find many more stories about these people. I've written quite a lot about Nathan and Lena and about their accomplishments, but also about other members of the family. And if you have any questions, you can write to me. I welcome the contacts. On our website, we have a page called Contact Us, and you can write on that. We also have a Facebook page, or you can write directly by email. <coughs> it's hard to talk for so long. So for now, I want to thank you for your patience and your attention. And I especially want to thank all of you who didn't fall asleep during my talk. Good job. So now I'm going to open the floor up for questions and turn this back over to Alan. <coughs> so Alan, now you have to unmute. I was going to say, would you like to get yourself a drink while, while people think of questions to us? I have one here, thank you. George it's hard to well. talk for so long. But tear on. Right, we've got some Americans here. So, Rene, would you like to ask a question? Unmute yourself. Rene, unmute. Unmute. Must have. Disappeared. 
All right. Who, well, you don't have to be American to ask a question. Who would like to ask a yes, question? Yes. Yeah, Renee. Where is she? I don't know. I can't see her. Yes, there she is. Renee, can you unmute yourself? She doesn't know how, maybe. Yeah, I think you're right. It's on the on bottom the left hand corner of your screen, you should have a, a. We can't do it for you, unfortunately. Right, anyone else? I'd like to ask you. Muttle. 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 Okay, off you go. Mute, unmute. Unmute, unmute. unmute for everybody. Can you have, can we can have everybody on mute. That's fine. All oh, right, hold on. Okay, hold on. David's disappeared. And I'm, I'm Where's the, where's the... Oh, yeah. There we are. Try now. No, they haven't got anything to do with the sound of God. <laughs> Hello, Potter, yes. Now you can unmute yourselves. We have. Okay, I'm there. Muffle. Right. Okay. Muffle, right, here we go. By the fact that our town is called Natanya and not Natanya. And I did hear in the distant past that there was a degree of dissatisfaction with the um, promises of Nathan Strauss. Is there any truth in that matter? And therefore, they decided to call the town Nertanya as opposed to Natanya. Joan, you're muted again. Sorry. Sorry, I, I, I don't know about that. I, I, I think it just has to do with pronunciation, that, that yeah. Americans are not that sophisticated and, and mm. most, most of us don't know, know Hebrew. Um, mm. I don't think that there is any, there was, at least from the family, I've never heard that there was any dissatisfaction with, with the name. Renee, you're unmuted now. Please ask a question. No, you no, she has to unmute herself. Unmute yourself again. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, there you are. Is, is, the, is there an actual museum <laughs> person can visit? And about how far is Smithtown from Manhattan? <laughs> there is not an actual museum. <coughs> I work out of my home. We have a huge archive and people are welcome to visit. I live 54 miles east of New York City on the North Shore of Long Island. And I do welcome scholars and researchers to visit our archive, to come here. Um, I don't obviously keep the materials in, at, in my home because of danger of fire, but we do have a very large storage facility where we keep our materials. And when people come, I bring whatever they're interested in. Uh, to see. And in fact, right now, I'm working with two authors who are writing books about Nathan. One is a, a woman, she, she already has 50 books to her credit, and uh, she's writing a young adult book about Nathan. And the other is a, a gentleman who is a scholar and, and uh, has worked in the philanthropy field for, for his entire career. And he's just retired and decided that's what he wants to do as a retirement project. And so he's been out here several times. Uh, because of COVID, we've taken a little hiatus, but he's gonna be back next month uh, for the first time in several months. And he's been using our materials. I bring them. I don't know if you can see behind me, I have this large room and there's a ping pong table in the middle of it. And so I bring the boxes back from storage with all the materials and, and we set somebody up on the other end of this room and they can work all day. We have we have photocopy machines and scanners and, and people usually bring their own laptops and uh, we make all of our materials available, but we don't have a physical presence. Thank you. Uh, yes. Marlene. Yes, can I just ask, um, what happened to Nathan and Lena on the um, Titanic? No, were they what? on the Titanic or they didn't um, go they, on? They were never scheduled. There is a, an erroneous story that they were supposed to go on Titanic and that his older brother Isidore did. And the reason is because ah. 
is because Isidore was much more mercantile, much more interested in, in the trappings, and Nathan was a philanthropist and much more interested in the goodness of people. And that's why Isidore went and why he died. But that not, is not a true story. Uh, at the time the Titanic sank, Nathan and Lena had been in Palestine, but then he went to Rome. He was participating in, a, in an international conference on tuberculosis. Uh -huh. And he was never scheduled to be on Titanic. And Isidore and Ida had spent the winter in Europe, in, in Cap Martin, and then had traveled to Paris and London, and it was just time to go home. <coughs> and at the time, there was a coal strike in London. And because, because Titanic was being um, launched, and it was the biggest and the best and the most, all the coal from the other ships were being diverted to Titanic. And so it was pretty much the only ship that was leaving. And so they booked passage, you know, they always traveled well, but it, was, it wasn't because they needed to be on the biggest and the best and the most, it was because that was the ship that was going at the time when they wanted to go. If he had a been, Natanya wouldn't be Natanya, would it? I wonder what we would have called it. <laughs> well, Nathan was very devoted to Palestine and yeah. was already contributing to the food stations and teaching people uh, jobs so might, and, and, might you know, still and the Jus Jerusalem it, uh, yeah. Center. So it yeah. may have happened anyway. Yes. Yeah. What would you would you say, Joan, that 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 was a, the enthusiasm for the Zionism with all members of his family or just Nathan? I'm sorry. Tell that, Tell me that again. Was the enthusiasm for Zionism and Palestine as it then was? just confined to Nathan or the other members of the family? Yes, yes. And his son, Nathan Jr., carried on uh, that spirit of Zionism after him. But the other members of the family, although all of them acknowledged, certainly in that generation, their Judaism and were members of synagogues and observant on some level, um, I don't recall that anybody else in the family was an avid Zionist. They were all philanthropists. They all gave money to various causes and mostly Jewish causes, but but not Zionism. I don't know why. It happens in families. Yeah. Okay. Who who who's next for a question? Even though he bought out um, the Macy's stores, he didn't change the name. He kept the name Macy's. It, the, the, the store had been in business since 1844. So by the time they bought it in 1896, that it had already grown and um, was quite well known. Yes. And, and indeed, they had been owners, part owners, since 1888. Yeah, my, <laughs> so, my, my son lives in Philadelphia, and I did the tour of the Macy's. It's a huge Macy's in Philadelphia and they um, they do a special historical tour and tell you all about the founding of it. And uh, they they have right at the top, all the, the top stories are very interesting. Um, you know, the top parts of the, the building where there's a lot of historical stuff. It's very, very- In Philadelphia? In Philadelphia, it's okay. worth a visit, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, they own many other, as as they were getting bigger, I'm, in, in two weeks I'm going to give another talk about the Strausses, a different aspect of the Strausses. And in that talk I mentioned that they they when they started to expand, they also started to buy up other firms. And so they they owned Wanamakers. Because oh, it was Wanamaker who founded that one in Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah, and they also owned Bamberger's, which was in New yeah. Jersey. Janet, have you got your hand up? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry. No, Janet, is a question. First of all, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Thank you. Very, very interesting. I have a question. Strauss ice cream, is that anything to do with the family? No. No. And there's a Strauss dairy. It's in Northern California. And that also does that. There is a Strauss winery that, that it does have to do with the family. It was a very small winery, but not, not Strauss ice cream and not Strauss dairies. Oh, okay, thank you. And definitely not jeans. Everybody not has to say it. Strauss. No. <laughs> uh, 
I do have a question, Joan. How did you become the archivist for the family? <laughs> That's an interesting and long story. Um, my training is in special education. I, I was a teacher. And when I had kids, my husband was very wonderful and said, wouldn't you love to stay home with them? And I said, yes. And of course, this was a very, very long time ago when women could afford to stay home. It, and, and so I was able to, to be a, an at-home mom, which was the best. And uh, when they got to be junior high school age, um, I started to worry that my brain was going to atrophy if I didn't do something. And I, and I love being home with my kids. So I, I really, I'm, I, as you may be able to sense, I'm an A-type. I don't know how to do anything a little bit, but I wanted to do something. And so I put an ad in the New York Times. This was long before internet was around, just saying that I would do research for people. And I, what I thought was that I could read some books and write some reports, but I didn't have to, to work in the afternoon when my kids were home or school holidays or in the summer. And I could only accept assignments that were interesting to me. And that's indeed what happened. And then in 1990, a man named Bob Strauss called me and said, my family owned Macy's for a hundred years. And on a handshake, uh, we were promised all of the materials that we were, had stored within Macy's. But that uh, because it was so bitter, this promise has been reneged upon and we don't have any uh, paper. We didn't have a contract or anything signed. It was just on this handshake that we were promised this. So since 1986, 1990, he had been hiring people to try and get the family's papers out of Macy's. And he asked if I could do that. And I said, well, I don't really know, but uh, if you put me in touch with somebody inside Macy's who's uh, still loyal to the family, I'll go talk to that person and see what, can happen. And here I am 31 years later, got to see all the materials, got them out. And then no one had seen these things in over a hundred years and no one had any idea what was there. <coughs> and a lot of it was from the early 1800s written in old German business papers, written in old German. So we had to have That's them amazing. translated and then they had to be organized. And, uh, then in 1993, I started writing a newsletter and we wanted to, to find the, the family members. So Bob, this guy who hired me, um, came to, he was living in Santa Barbara. So he came to New York and he knew about eight people in the family. That was it. And so uh, he asked them to bring their, their address books. And I copied out all the addresses and names of all of the relatives. And I wrote them letters and explained what we were doing and said, who's your mother? Who's your father? Who's your sister? Who's your brother? And I started writing to them. And we now have more than 15,600 people in the database. It's quite oh, extraordinary. Family. But, but I, from that very beginning, I, in 1993, I started to write this newsletter just to explain what I was doing. And then it's just grown from there. On our website, by the way, all the issues, back issues of the newsletter are posted in the archive section. And I've written about the family extensively and especially about Nathan and his generation. So if you are interested, very recently, I wrote a very large article about Lena because people don't write about the wives quite so much. So I've been trying to include more about women. Um, and so if you're interested more, there's much more information about him and about them. So uh, I encourage you to visit and and uh, take a look at some of those articles. So that's how it started. And it's just, you know, it's, it's they're, they're the best family. They are, in, in all of these years, I've met hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And there's only one person I could say was not nice. Not and, of course, they're all very appreciative, which is lovely. And they leave me alone. They let me do whatever I want, which is the <laughs> best. Okay, any more, any more questions or observations? It's a, it's a whole new world. It's so interesting, yes. very interesting. Fascinating, actually. Such an amazing family. It, it, it truly is. Um, <clears throat> each, each one of them. Is it's a bit like the Rothschilds, isn't it? You know, this whole family of doing... But, I mean, I think what, one of the things for me that's interesting is that none, none of them sought publicity or recognition. They just mm -hmm. did what they did because they felt they had to. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, I, and I think that that's quite remarkable. 
Yeah. It's just that they felt it was their honor. I mean, that's why I spent so much time in the beginning telling you about the family, about, right. about their, where they came from, because there was this moral, this ethical component that was very, very strong. Um, I told you that I write this newsletter. I write 12 pages of newsletter twice a year. But I also write another four pages that only goes to family because I write about living people. And I, one of my jobs I, I feel is to protect their privacy. Hmm. In this four page newsletter, which only goes to family members, two of those pages is a mini biography of a young person who is carrying on this family tradition of public service and philanthropy. And there is never a problem finding somebody to write about. There's, there are so many young people who are so mindful of their heritage and this gift they've been given that it's really, uh, the problem is sometimes not writing about somebody, you know, or, or limiting, like, I'll do you next time because, because they really are that remarkable. Valerie, I would love for you to write to me because yes, we do need help with typing. We always need help and volunteers. So, so if you want to send me a note. Andy, oh, got a question? I am info at straussehistory.org. I wanted to make a statement. Back in the 80s, I did business with Carolyn. I'm not going to give her last name. And she is the most humble woman. Yes. Animal lover. Wrote a book on, on, on dogs, which she gave me, and we're, we're still friends. And I think about this woman with all her wealth, but she is the most humblest of women. They, they were all like that, really. Yeah. I mean, you, you would never know that these, this is a rich family. You would never yeah. know that this is a prominent family. I mean, and, and there are, in this family, ambassadors. There are, you know, ministers of... of, of, of uh, uh, Oscar was minister to Constantinople twice and then and then ambassador mm -hmm. to Turkey. I mean, the, he was in the cabinet. He was the first Jewish member of cabinet. Um, they're just remarkable. Uh, Isidore was also in the House of Representatives. I mean, he, he was president of this multi, multi-million dollar corporation. They, they earned a hundred million dollars mm -hmm. in 1929, even notwithstanding the crash. I mean, they're just remarkable and they gave back. I spoke with Caroline on the phone two days ago. She's lovely. <coughs> well, okay, unless there's any more questions, I feel very guilty that we're keeping, that Joan, Joan's throat may give out completely. <laughs> nope. but, it's fine, keep going. I've got water and I've got cough drops. Are there any more questions or points? Before you go, Andy, is your hair? Would you like to give a little plug for as you brought us the speaker for next week? We've got a, a, almost an equally distinguished speaker next week because it's the edition before the Monday Club before Yom Hatzmaut. So, Andy, would you tell us about next week's, please? With pleasure. Next week, David Matlow from Toronto will be speaking to us about Herzl. And he has the largest private collection of Herzl memorabilia. Um, we've heard him speak in Toronto, he spoke in England, he's spoken here in Jerusalem, and he even gave us a pair of socks with Herzl's on it. <laughs> he's a, he is a wonderful, wonderful man, and we're very lucky to have him. His spouse so, is in Herzl, they were good friends with him. Really? Yep. They knew everybody. I mean, I'll mention that to David. Well, I must say, uh, if if his speaker is half as good as today's speaker, we'll be very fortunate indeed. We've had a, a, a it's an amazing first two meetings of our new of our second year as the virtual Monday Club. So I want to thank Joan for coming thank all this way. Uh -huh. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. And it's been really lovely. So if you, if you if you speak to any members of the family, and when you do, perhaps you'll tell them, and I, I know you're going to take put the recording around to your mailing list, um, which David will make available quite shortly. Um, but please tell them that you, that you had a very attentive audience here who were really enthralled with the story, 
and we really enjoyed it. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us at Young Israel of Netanya. Thank Netanya. you so much. This was great. Thank you.